<laughs> Greetings. Welcome to another Thursday night study hall. Thank you so much for letting us come into your home to touch your heart, your home, your family with the truth of God's word. That's why we're here. I preached on Sunday morning about Paul the Apostle and uh, talked a little bit about his passion and his purpose. And I certainly am not Paul the Apostle, but I would love to steal his purpose and his passion for ministering. Uh, it was to equip the saints. And this is really what kind of gets me going, is if, if, if I think for just one moment God could use me to help somebody grasp some truth from his word that would change your life, transform your family, and create a destiny that you would not have received without that truth from God's word, then man, I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm overjoyed, and I'm overwhelmed that God would use me to help you see something that perhaps... Uh, you would not have seen unless you tuned in and listened to us. So thank you for your willingness to listen. Thank you for your willingness to learn. And I pray that God will use us tonight to encourage you, equip you, and challenge you to live the life God wants you to live. We are in week five. I cannot believe it, but we are that far in to stop trying, start training. We're talking about things that we can pick up like weights, that make a, uh, a person who's working out to grow muscle, that we, there are things we can pick up that will change the way we live uh, now in this life and opens the door to wonderful things we can do for the kingdom of God. I'd love to pray with you before we get started, so can I just do that real quick? Father, we're going to open your word and we ask once again that you would touch our minds, our hearts, uh, every home that's listening, every individual, God, I pray that you just equip us to receive the truth of your word, that we might be changed, transformed, not just informed, but transformed by the truth of your word. Bless your servant, God. Help me uh, somehow, God, stretch, as it were, past my limitations and touch people with the truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I cannot recap. I can't go back. We've spent at least three weeks talking about the number one thing we must pick up, the number one tool we can use so that we're no longer just trying. I'm trying to live for Jesus. I'm trying to do better. Stop trying. Start training. Number one was, and we talked about it for three weeks, to increase our knowledge of spiritual principles to be able not to just read the word and see words on a page that we look at and go, yeah, that sounds great. Yes, that's cool. But no, what can I take out of that? What can I learn? What principle can I get from that that I be able to remember, meditate on, pray about, begin to work and use in my life, in my marriage, in my family? And so we've spent three weeks, I can't go backwards, talking about increasing our knowledge of spiritual principles one of the things that I see as a pastor after all these years of pastoring is, is that if people will just grasp a spiritual truth and make it their truth. Listen, whenever you speak <clears throat> over your life, over your family, over a situation, whenever what you say to it mentally or verbally, whatever you think about a situation, if you're thinking what God's word says, how can you go wrong? If you're quoting what God has said, how can you go in the wrong direction? If you're praying over that situation, what God's word says, how can you be praying the wrong thing? You don't have to struggle to find out what the will of God is. I know what your word says. So when we understand the principles of God's word, suddenly power can begin to flow, I believe, in our prayer life, in our thinking, in our words, in our actions. I said I wasn't going to go backwards. Listen to the last three weeks. If you don't know how to find a principle, if you don't know how to grasp that principle, if you don't know how to make action out of that principle in your life, listen to the last three weeks. Principles make all the difference. Principles are what change things. Okay, uh, I told you last week I gave it away. I said, number two, we're going to look at how do we live in God's word? How do we live in the word of God? Okay, I'm reading it a little bit. I'm starting to figure out how to find a principle. But how do I live in God's word? And can I even do that? I've had people say to me, I don't even understand what that means to live in God's word. 
Um, <laughs> so we're, we're going to take a little look at that this week. We might take two weeks, but we'll, we'll certainly talk about it tonight at length. I want to talk to you about learning how to take your mind, bathe it in the word of God and then live in that word, live in that truth. So that now the word of God is not just something I know. It's not just some principle I understand. I know the principle. No, no, no. I'm now living in that word. I, my life is living in that moment, living in that thought process. So it, it sounds a little mystical and it sounds like, ooh, this is something you got. Listen, it's not. There's nothing mystical about it. Uh, that now there's something supernatural about it, uh, but it's not mystical. It's, it's not given to certain people. I meet people sometimes they say, oh, if I was a pastor, you know, it's all you do all day. <laughs> it's not all I do all day. But I learned years ago that the healthiest place for me to be is living in God's word. Now, look, it's the obvious. So let's get that out of the way. If I'm not reading the word of God, I'm not living in the word of God. If I'm not taking time to read it and you should get a plan for reading God's word. So before I even give you a slide, let me just get out of the way what I what I call a simplistic answer to this question. How do I live in God's word? Number one is you should get a Bible reading plan. Uh, some of the best that you'll ever find are on this little app called the Bible app, version. Uh, and if you get the Bible app, there are all kinds of reading plans on there where you can read the Bible in two years or three years or a real aggressive plan is to read it in 12 months. Um, I, 12 months is a little much for me, especially if you're a new believer. Relax, calm down. It's a big book. There's a lot of great truths in it. Uh, you might want to slow down a little bit and maybe start with a two year or a three year reading plan. But they have them there on the YouVersion app and you can sign up for one. And every day it'll go ding and you read the chapters. It'll tell you. And guess what? Two years from now, you would have said, wow, I've read from Genesis to Revelation. I've read the whole thing. Wonderful to do. Uh, some people read it. Some people read some of it. Some people listen to some of it. Maybe you spend some time in the car. Maybe you uh, maybe you're back to work, but you commute on the train uh, today with our phones and all these modern technology things. You can put your little bud in your ear and you can listen to the word of God on the train. I I'm not saying that's not a great way to do it. it it's not my favorite way to do it because I think whenever we kind of fit the word of God into our schedule. So don't listen. If you're listening to the word of God on the train, keep doing it. I'm just saying that to live in it sometimes means sacrifice. We have to give up some time. So I like a reading plan where I get up in the morning or in the evening. I take the 30, 40 minutes. I take 20 minutes and I'm on my reading plan. I think if you read like 20 minutes a day, you can read through the Bible easily in, in two years. Uh, so uh, and don't panic. If it takes you three, it's OK. If you miss a day, it's OK. Remember, now this is the simple answer to the question. What does it mean to live in God's word? So get a reading plan. Uh, then I also think you ought to have a what I call a reading and application plan. And that is and I'm not going to have time to go into it tonight, but that's that secret place that we've taught about for years here at New Life. Same place, same time, same principle, same project, same discipline. It's got to happen at the same time, same place. If you have a reading plan, you can read anytime you want. You say, oh, I got a free half hour. Let me do my reading. OK, great. You're just you got a reading plan. My quiet time, my secret place with God is a little different. I'm not going to read as much and I'm going to look for something smaller that I can think about all day. So I believe that when I'm getting down to now where I'm not just reading the Bible to read it, I'm reading it for some application, for some insight. That happens same time, same place, uh, same chair, uh, outdoors, indoors, whatever it is, kitchen chair. Uh, living room, whatever it is. I sit in the same place every day at 6 a.m., 635, 728, whatever it is. But I do this for 10 minutes and I'm reading through the book of John. Pick a New Testament book. I'm going to start with the book of John. It's a great place to start. And I'm going to read every day. And all I'm going to read is three verses, four verses. Some days I might only read one verse and bam, it hits me. I'm like, wow, I got my journal. I pray, God, I'm going to read your word. Speak to me. I read a few verses. John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word. If you haven't amplified, it'll say in the beginning was the word Jesus. And he was there in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. That's the first two or three verses there. I'm paraphrasing it, but trust me, it's there. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God because the word is God. Jesus is God. 
Jesus was there in the beginning. He's not an afterthought. All things were made by him. And so I write in my journal, Jesus was there in the beginning. Uh, God and Jesus are one. Uh, Jesus was there in the beginning and he's still there now. Jesus is the word of God. So the word of God is Jesus speaking to me. Boom. That's all I write down. And then I pray, God, I pray your word now. And I pray, God, that you just touch me with your word. God, you've said that the word is alive and that it is Christ speaking to me. So, God, speak to me through your word. Whenever I read it, talk to me, lead me, direct me. God, I thank you for your word that blesses me and directs my life. And God, as I live through this day today, I'm going to work in a couple minutes. God, would you just lead me by the truths of your word? Jesus, speak to me, guide me, direct me through the word that I've read this morning. I thank you that your word says you were always there, which means you're going to be with me today. You were there yesterday, today and forever. And you're with me wherever I go. In Jesus name, I believe this. Amen. What are you doing? You're living God's word. Why? Because I'm reading a little bit. I'm writing something down. I'm praying it. Then at lunchtime, I don't need to open my Bible. I'm busy. I'm at lunch. But I say my grace and I don't just say, Lord, bless this pastrami sandwich. <laughs> I'm hungry now for a pastrami sandwich. God, bless this pastrami sandwich. I thank you for my lunch. I thank you for the morning. But God, I also thank you once again. I just am reminded, God, that your word this morning said that you're always with me and that, God, you're alive and your word is alive. And I thank you, God, that you're with me today and alive with me right now. Even as I eat my lunch and all morning today, you were with me. Thank you for being with me. What have I just done? I've taken what I read this morning in God's word and I'm praying it again at lunchtime. And maybe I'm going into a meeting this afternoon and on my way walking down the corridor with my eyes wide open. It's okay. You can pray with your eyes open. Lord, I'm going into this meeting right now. You're saying this in your head. Don't talk to the Lord going down the corridor. Your worker, your coworkers will think you're nuts. Lord, I'm going into this meeting right now. And I read this morning in your word that your word is alive and it goes with me everywhere. So I pray that the word of God would go with me into this meeting. Jesus, give me the words to speak. Give me ears to hear. Give me wisdom. Give me favor. God, go with me. Jesus is with me right now. And I claim the promise of that right now as I go into this meeting. Woo, what's starting to happen? At lunch, in a meeting, when I'm on my way home, I'm driving back home to my family and I say, God, I thank you for that word I read this morning. I've had a crazy day at work, but I'm pulling into my driveway. God, I thank you that you have been with me through this day. You're going to be with me right now as I go back in there and, uh, and, and hug my spouse and, and reconnect with my kids. God, you're going to be with me. You're going to be alive. And so all day today, what have I been doing? I've been living in John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. That's all I'm doing. Tomorrow, I'm going to live in John chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, maybe 7. I'm going to live in some other verses tomorrow. And the next day, I'm going to live in John chapter 1, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Or maybe one day, I'm just going to live in John 3, 16. I don't know. God will speak to you. But whatever you get out of that, live in it throughout the day. Exercise it in your mind. We're starting to get into the deeper part of this now. So, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is alive it is living Whew. I'm telling you now I'm starting to teach so let me let me let me slow down I got excited there. let me slow down you see if you're just doing a reading plan and you should but if you're just doing a reading plan and you're not doing that second part that I talked to you about. See, if you're doing a reading plan and you're today you're reading four chapters or seven chapters and a psalm and one chapter in Proverbs. Um, first of all, the reading plans will be all over the place, which is OK. They'll, they'll jump around a little bit. But I'm not making it alive in my mind because I, I need to just take a little piece and chew on it. But it is alive. The word of God is alive. The Bible that you have right now in your home, that book that you have, Genesis to Revelation, that book is not like any other book you possess. It's, it's not just filled with information. It is filled with the power of transformation. But you have to believe that it's alive. It's not a dead book. It's, it's an old book, but it's not a dead book. It's alive. You say, yeah. Well, alive, that's a big quote. I'm just reading to you what it says, Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive. 
It is living and active and full of power, making it uh, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of your nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. When you do the secret place and you're just chewing all day on those three or four verses, do you know what they'll do? Some days they will so lift your soul up out of the flesh experience of your day. They will elevate your spirit above the dilemma and the, the calamity and you'll walk in peace when everyone else is walking in struggle. And that's what the word of God does. Why? Because it's alive. There are other days when you'll read a portion of scripture and it will challenge you and quicken you and all day long it will trouble you. Why? Because what you've read you're not doing or what you've read you're still struggling with. And instead of wanting to say it when you pray over your pastrami sandwich, you'll be just like, Lord, bless me for my sandwich. But I don't want to think about those verses I read this morning because they're troubling me. They're, I'm not being the way I'm supposed to be with my spouse. I'm not thinking the right way about my brother or sister in Christ. I'm not treating humans right. God, I got a bad attitude. And that word is, it's quickening me. It's cutting me apart, God. <laughs> it's alive. It's life transforming and changing. I, I just want to break it down a little bit for you. And I've underlined it in my notes here. It says the word of God is alive. I got that underlined. And then I got full of power. That's underlined. And then I got the vision of the soul and spirit. That's underlined. They'll probably do it for you down below. Listen, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Can, can I just break those apart real quick? And, and then we'll, we'll keep moving where we're going. So watch this. First sentence. God's word is alive. The word of God is alive. God's word is alive. The Bible is often referred to as, in fact, the living word of God. In the parable of the sower, you can read about that in Luke chapter 8. Jesus is talking about a, a parable that goes out and sows the word of God. He sows it like, like, a, like a man throwing seed onto the ground. And he likens the word of God to a literal seed. Listen, when we receive God's word, when we receive it, when we read it, when we meditate on it, when we chew it over, when we put it in our journal, when we pray it out loud, it's a tiny little seed. It's just one verse. It's not. That's why I, I get it. I get, some of you, I get emails every time I do this. People say, you're discouraging people from reading the whole word of God. I am not. Go back. Listen to what I said. Get a reading plan. Read through the Bible in two years. But if you read through the Bible in two years and you haven't been changed by any of it, you're not reading it right. You're just reading a book. You want to be able to take a seed from the word of God and, and it's alive. It's a seed. When we receive God's word, it, it's like a seed. It, it doesn't appear to have any life in it. It's just some words on a page. But once it's sown into good soil, remember, go read the parable of the sower in Luke 8. Once it's sown into good soil, it has the potential to produce the most incredible things in our lives. Planted in the fertile soil of my own heart that is tender and ready to receive God's word, God's word will begin to reproduce the very nature of Christ in me. Why? And I've just made this about John chapter 1, verse 1. I could have picked any portion of scripture. The word of God was there in the beginning. The word of God is alive. The word of God is God. Jesus is the Lord, our heavenly father. They are one in the same. I believe in the Trinity, in other words. That's a tiny little seed. It's just one little verse. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. All things were made by God, by the word. But when I sow that little seed into my heart I, and I live it and I walk through it and it lives in me, six months from now when I lose my job or I get a bad diagnosis from a doctor or something bad happens to me. I go through a calamity. All of a sudden inside me, there's a tree full of fruit that says it's going to be all right. Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus has created all things. He makes all things. He is all things. He's all powerful. His word is alive in me and this too shall pass and I will get through this. 
See, if you wait for the storm to try to claim that promise, it's a little late because why? It's just seeds. And seeds won't get you through a storm. You need the harvest to get you through the storm. So when I when I plant the word of God in my life and I meditate on it, I chew on it, I walk with it through the day, I live in the word of God, something begins to grow inside me. What is it? The very nature of Christ. That's a bold statement. No, it isn't. Listen to me. John 1 1 says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And through the word, all things were made. One of the names of Jesus is the living word of God. This book is alive. It's not the message of some prophet or some guru or some psychiatrist. It is the living word of God. Jesus was the word alive. Woo! Hallelujah. So if I take the word of God and I take a little seed of it... And I plant it deep down in my heart and I water it and I nurture it and I make my heart receptive to the word of God. Yes, I'm reading chapters. Yeah, I'm on a reading program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But today I took a seed. I took some simple truth of it and I planted it deep in my soul. What happens? The very nature of Christ begins to show forth in my life, in the way I react to a problem, in the way I deal with my kids, in the way I look at money, in the way I look at politics. (laughs) so suddenly everything is affected by what by the very nature of Christ why because the word is Christ Christ is the word God's word is alive the antidote to your death emotionally spiritually financially relationally is the living word of God applied to that problem and situation The word of God is alive. Uh, The Bible is often referred to, as I said. So listen, uh, next slide. God's word is powerful. Uh, Just as a great tree begins as a seed in the ground, God's word in you has creative and transforming power. As you feed on God's word, it will begin to transform you from the inside out. So I've already preached this to you. Listen, God's word is alive. I'm just I'm just walking through Hebrews 412 with you. See, if if I was in my secret place, if it was in my quiet time and I came to Hebrews 412, I wouldn't read any more that day. There's enough right here in this verse for me to meditate on, to chew on all day long. Why? Because at lunchtime, what I can tell myself is I can't remember that whole verse. Now, maybe maybe you got it. Maybe because it's on your U version app, maybe you can pull it up at lunchtime and look at it again. But I can remember this from reading this morning, that God's word is alive and it is all powerful. So no matter what I face this morning or this afternoon or tomorrow, God's word is going to carry me through this. I'm living in the power of his word. Now, I also know this because I read it this morning in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, that God's word is alive. It's living. It's powerful. It's active. It's energized and effective. But what do I know about a seed and what do I know about the word of God? It might take a little time for this to happen. So today, maybe I don't feel all the power that uh, Pastor Mark does when he's talking about it, but he'd been on the way a long time. I'm a newer Christian. That's all right. I'm going to take some time and let this get some roots. I, uh, I made the mistake of planting some bamboo in my yard many, many years ago. My landscape guy said, don't plant it. You'll regret it. I did. I had to dig it up and move it. Uh, what I didn't know about bamboo was, and if you buy a little, little plant of bamboo, I bought this little $25 little bush of bamboo and I planted it. And my guy said, don't, it's evasive. You'll never get it. I said, don't worry. It's fine. I know what I'm doing. And no, 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 no. And I planted it. And guess what? Nothing happened. One year, two years, three years, four years. It didn't, it didn't get hardly any bigger. It got a little bit taller, got a little bit thicker, but not, not much going on there. And I was like, I don't know why that guy was so worried. In fact, he was still my landscape guy and he would come over sometimes and I'm like, hey, there, there's that bamboo you're worried about. You know, it looks beautiful. Look at it. It's gorgeous, you know. And he would look at me and smile and go, just wait. Man, I had no idea. Seven years. I didn't know this about bamboo. Some bamboo is five, some is seven. But what, what I found out was that on the seventh year in my yard, 
I'm talking 20 feet down in my yard, 20 feet away from the bush, from the plant, 20 feet away. Boop, this little thing popped out of the ground. And 20 feet that way, boop, there was another one. And 11 feet, boop, and another one. And six feet, boop. And I'm talking 30, 40, 50 of these things popped up all over the place. I thought, what in the world is that? I didn't recognize this little green thing going out of the ground. And man, when I tell you grow, I, I got pictures. I could prove it. We would put a ruler there, and I took photographs. There were days when that little stalk of bamboo that was growing 20 feet away would grow literally an inch, an inch and a half in one day. I'd take a picture on a Monday, Tuesday, it'd be an inch and a half taller. Wednesday, two inches taller. One day, I think the biggest we ever had was just a little over two inches in, in 24 hours. And all of a sudden, in my yard, what did I have? I, I had nine foot, ten foot tall bamboo 20 feet away from that thing. And what I learned about bamboo was this, is that while it looks like nothing's happening, because <laughs> now I, I dug it up. We, we killed some of it and we dug it up. And I moved it to a part of the property that we don't care about. And, and I'm letting it grow as a border. And man, what a border. Whew, it's unbelievable. But again, I moved it, didn't do anything. Two years, three years, four years. And all of a sudden, boop, 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 boop. And now what comes up out of the ground is thick like this, like bamboo like that. And some of it, Again, grows two, an inch, inch and a half, two inches in a day. And it's 20, 30, 40 feet high. Some of it's 30 feet high out there. But what I know about bamboo is this, is the reason nothing happens for years is because when you plant it, what it does is it focuses on the downward growth and the roots before it ever shows up. And so long before you ever see anything happening on the outside, there are deep roots that are growing on the inside. So if you're a new believer, a new convert, and you're saying, man, I don't have that power yet. I don't have the victory you're talking about. Be patient. Keep doing the, the, this exercise. Keep meeting with the Lord. Keep doing the secret place. Keep meeting with him. Keep digesting. Keep reading just two or three verses. Stick with the reading plan, but meditate on those three or four verses and do it and do it and do it and do it. And I don't know how long it'll take, but I promise you this. Somewhere in your life, a year from now, two years from now, you're going to be just going about your everyday life. And all of a sudden you're going to hear boop, and the word of God is going to be growing in your life. And you're going to your your wife is going to say something. And instead of responding like you've always responded for the last 20 years in your marriage, something will come out of your mouth that will be so loving and so kind and so gracious. And your wife's going to look at you and say, OK, I love what you just said. But what have you done with my husband? And you're going to say, I have no idea. I don't know why I answered like that. It's a great answer. I'm so glad I did. But what I've been praying and hoping for is that the word of God would become powerful in my life and change who I am. And suddenly my speech is becoming more Christ-like. Suddenly the tree, the fruit, God's word is powerful. It's alive, but you must be patient. So I get it. Listen, some of you do this. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, I did that secret place thing for a week. Like, you know, I don't see much change and my wife and I are still arguing. A week. Dig some roots. Get some of the word down inside you. God's word is alive. God's word is powerful. God's word divides between soul and spirit. We're still in Hebrews uh, chapter four. Just that one verse. Look at how much we're digging out of this. Talk about a day's worth of digging here. God's word divides between soul and spirit. Sometimes it can be difficult to even know the true motives of your own heart. I do things sometimes and I, I pray and I hope I'm doing it for the right motive. And later on you find out that because eh, you're not happy with what happened or you're not satisfied with what happens. And you look back and you realize, you know, my motive was not to glorify God. My motive was perhaps to glorify myself. You know, maybe I was trying to do that to prove how successful I was instead of worrying about the kingdom. It, it, it's amazing sometimes. We can deceive ourselves. Uh, not frequently, but and the longer you're saved, I pray that it, opens, it, it happens less because the word of God is boop, 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 growing in your life. But, but sometimes it can be difficult to know even the true motives of our own heart. David knew this when he cried, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. That's Psalm 139. David knew, look, God, I can't do this by myself. So if you'll search me as I live in your word, let the word search me out. Listen, the word of God 
can penetrate with, with surgeon-like precision between your soul and your spirit. It, it has the ability to pierce your life and expose the truth to unveil Christ within you in, in a way that nothing else can do. I mean, a pastor can help you. A sermon can help you. There are times I've listened to someone preaching and uh, there are two preachers that I try to listen to every week because, you know, I preach to people. So I need somebody to preach to me. And, and there are two preachers that I try to listen to every week, at least one of them. And, and, and man, there are some weeks when I listen to it and I'm like, man, that really, whew, that challenged me. Uh, many weeks I'm blessed, but other weeks I'm challenged. Why? Because uh, the man is preaching the word of God. So the word of God can be preached. When the word of God is preached, it's alive, it's powerful. When you hear a sermon, it's not some dead, it's not a speech, it's not a lecture. Uh, it, it's the living word of God being preached to people. And so a preacher can sometimes speak to us and thank God for that. But man, there's nothing like digging in yourself to God's word. And like I said, some days you'll be blessed by that verse. Other days that verse will trouble you all day long. You'll say, man, that stuff I read this morning. Oh, ouch, man, God, you're really challenging me here. God, you've questioned one of my motives. Why am I really doing that? Why am I really so driven to that, in other words? And, and sometimes God will reveal to us that, you know, the things we're driven to, they're not sin. We're, we've been saved a long time. It's not like I'm driven to sin, but I'm driven to something and I'm so passionate about it. And I'm so, uh, you know, kind of uh, driven to get that done that, all of a sudden that thing gets between me and my God time, me and my alone time. And, and all of a sudden God's challenging me to say, Mark, are, are you willing to give that up or at least dial it back? What, what can we, man, God, thank you. The word of God divides between soul and spirit. It helps me see uh, the truth. And, and then it goes even deeper because I believe it says there, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word exposes our innermost thoughts and the heart intent. Uh, knowledge and understanding of yourself can involve, as I've said, painful confrontation with your own weaknesses, your own frailties, your own sin, your own stumblings. But getting knowledge of yourself in a way that helps you align your life with God and the image of Christ uh, brings absolute hope and true freedom and an inner peace. I, I know it's hard, but it brings an inner peace. I'm like, oh, God, thank you for challenging me about that. God, thank you for exposing my innermost thoughts and my heart and my real intent. God, thank you, because, man, I would have messed up. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said that the human heart is deceitful above all things, uh, beyond our own understanding how evil it can be. So we need God's word and his help to uncover the hidden things that we're sometimes even unaware of, things that threaten to limit or sabotage our, our very lives, our, our, our spiritual walk. Remember, it's knowing the truth that sets you free. It's knowing the truth. And so that's what the Word of God does. It's alive. I can't, man, I can't stress to you enough the importance of this sacred book. It is alive. It is living. It is active. It is full of power. And you should have a reading plan where you're reading the whole thing. But if you're not digesting, living on a few verses at a time, living it out in your everyday life, musing it in a... Remember when you were in school, you learned a new word, you learned how to spell it, you learned how to pronounce it, and then the teacher would say, now I want you to use it in a sentence. Using it in a sentence proved what? That you truly understood, one, how to spell it, and two, more importantly, what the meaning of that word was because I can now use it in a sentence and the sentence makes sense. So uh, can I be that simplistic with you that it's, it, it's it, yes, you got to know the word of God. Yes, you got to read the word of God. But can you use it in a sentence? <laughs> can I use it in my Monday? Can I use it on Tuesday afternoon? Can I use it in my marriage? Can I use it in with my kids? Can I use it in my money? Can I use the word of God? Can I live in the word of God? Can I be empowered to live in the word? Because the word is alive inside me, changing who I am. Affecting, I believe, the very DNA, the way my mind actually works. The Bible talks about renewing the mind. Uh, my mind actually thinks differently. There are thoughts that I think today, and I know those are God thoughts. Those are God impressions. They're not, I would never think that way. I wouldn't be that kind. I wouldn't be that nice. But Christ is being manifested in me and through me, through the word of God. And it's not... Uh, 
It's not about trying because I, I, I said, we, you know, we're going to we're going to stop trying. We're going to start training. Some people say, you know, I want to be like Jesus. I just want to be more like Jesus. I, I, OK, great. Stop. Stop. How about you start training to be like Jesus? I want to be more like Jesus for my family. Are you reading the Bible? Are you doing what we're talking about? Well, no, I don't have the time. Then you're not. <laughs> you're still trying. You got to stop trying. You got to start training. God's word exposes our innermost thoughts and the heart, the intent of our heart. Jeremiah said the heart of man, the human heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. I listened to a TV preacher. I'm, I don't listen to him often, but someone sent me the clip. I listened to a TV preacher talking about people in a huge church, one of the biggest churches in America, standing there saying, what we need to come to terms with and understand is this, is that people are inherently good. The world is full of good people. People are inherently good. We need to believe the good in people. We need to see the positive in people. We need to see hope in people. Boy, it sounds so lovely, doesn't it? It sounds just so refreshing. And there's a grain of it that is true because all falsehood is based in some truth. Should I see the good in people? Should I look for the good in people? Yes, but to make from a pulpit preaching the gospel to people, that what we need to come to and understand is that all people are good. People are just good. We just need to believe people are good. It's an absolute contradiction of scripture. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. No, you're not good. I'm not good. I'm no good without the living word of God living within me, without Christ molding me, shaping me. My heart is crooked and dark and dismal and depressing. Maybe yours is a happy-go-lucky, but I promise you this, it's lost without Christ leading it and directing it. We must live in God's word. Listen, the Bible says, I'm going to go back to Joshua. It says the book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart from my mouth but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful. Now, I said I wasn't going to recap. Whew, man, if you listen to the three weeks about principles, this verse is jumping out at you. This verse is saying bam to you. Why? Because there's a principle here that it's not enough to just read the word, I got to do the word. I must be careful to do everything in it. I got to learn the principle and I got to apply the principle. When I've applied the principle, I can have confidence to know what? That my way will be prosperous and what I'm trying to do will be successful. My marriage can be prosperous. My relationship with my spouse can be blessed and successful. When? When I take the word of God and apply the word of God to that relationship. And I try living in the word, in that relationship. Now, now, now I can claim what God has promised here in Joshua chapter one. So I need to meditate on the word of God. I need to meditate on it. Uh, on what? On the mind of God, the thinking of God, I believe, is actually absorbed through simply reading and dwelling on the word of God. Just read it again and again. Something will come to life inside of you. The word of God, I believe, sharpens our response time to the Holy Spirit. It keeps us from falling or failing. Uh, I'm going to read some scriptures, but can, can I just, uh, I got to talk to you about this for one second. Leave that slide right there. Listen, the mind of God, the thinking of God is observed and absorbed, I should say. It's observed and then absorbed through simply reading and dwelling on the word of God. People say, oh, I want to be more like Jesus. Read the word. I want to do what God wants me to do. Read the word. Well, I'm going to go to a prayer meeting. Okay, great. Go to a prayer meeting. I got nothing against a prayer meeting. Go pray. You should pray. Hallelujah. But if you're praying and not reading the word, you're not going to change. The only way God changes human beings is through the word of God and by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not talk to you or work in your life if you're not reading the word of God. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you something. Uh, there's a portion of scripture that says, you know, when, when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance and give us help. Some people think that the Holy Spirit is just going to, going to gift us with, Ooh, 
I know what the word says. No, it says he will bring to your remembrance. What does that mean? You read it. You studied it. You meditated on it. You chewed it over. You tried to make application of it. You tried to use it in a sentence. And then four years later, when the natural brain would have forgotten that principle, but those roots are deep in your life and a situation comes up, boop, the word of God will pop up in your life alive. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is there to quicken it. The Word of God sharpens our response time to the Holy Spirit. When I'm reading the Word of God, when I'm doing what we're talking about doing here, the Holy Spirit can speak to me and challenge me, and I'm on board. I'm I'm there. I'm ready. Why? Because I'm in obedience. When I'm not reading the Word of God, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit. He got to come and keep pounding. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, I think, has got to take a two by four and whack us over the head. Sometimes the Holy Spirit's got to lead us into difficulty, into hardship. Why? Because we're not reading the Word. And and the Holy Spirit has got to draw us back to the Word. And and the Holy Spirit's got to draw us back to obedience. And so He lets us go through a difficulty, through a hardship. Why? Because if you're honest and you look back, you say, man, before this storm came, you know what? I wasn't really, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but I wasn't really in the Word. I wasn't really walking in the Word. I wasn't living in the Word. I was living for Jesus, but I wasn't living in the word. Not like you're talking about, Mark. Now I'm going through this trouble. Whoo, man, I'm in the word, baby. I'm living in the word. You say, oh, guess what? Thank God for the trouble. But the truth is, if we were living in the word, the trouble wouldn't have been necessary. The trial might not have been needed. Why? Because I'm I'm living in the word. And so I'm receptive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the word of God, they, they live and they work like this. The Holy Spirit will never direct you to do anything or say anything or think anything that isn't in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will always point back to Jesus. And who is Jesus? He's the living Word. (laughs) So the Holy Spirit will always draw us back to what? To Christ, point towards Christ and to the living Word. And the Holy Spirit will always marry us with the Word. Holy Spirit will never tell you to do something the Bible says is wrong. Holy Spirit will never direct you to do something if you're not reading the Word. They work together. It keeps us from falling and failing. It keeps me out of error and it keeps me out of stumbling. Why? Because I'm meditating on the Word of God and so I know the mind of God, the thinking of God. What's the will of God? I just wish I knew the will of God. Stop. Start a quiet time. Start a secret place. Will I know it next week? Will I know the mind of God next week? No, but you will. Start working on the roots. And the will of God, the mind of Christ, will show up. Uh, Can I read some scriptures real quick? Uh, It is Bible study, so it's okay, right? Uh, John 15, 7. It's amazing to me. The Word says this better than I can. I'm trying to teach it to you, but look what the Word says. John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if you are vitally united and my message lives in your heart. How do I live in the Word? Look what it says. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Whoa, wait a second. My prayer life can be affected by the way I read the Bible and the way I live in the word. You got it. The Bible says that if I treat my wife, I mean, think about how simplistic this is. The Bible says that if as a husband, I treat my wife rudely or uncordially, I'm unkind to her. The Bible says that my prayers will not be heard in heaven because of how I treated my wife. Yes. Why? Because it goes deeper than just my wife and I relationship. You see, my wife and I relationship is holy. It's sacred. It's sanctified. And it represents to the world the union of Christ and the church. So if I disrespect my wife, I'm disrespecting the union of Christ and the church. So it ain't a little thing. It ain't a little thing when I disrespect my wife. It's a big thing because it's disrespecting that big issue of Christ and the church. This is why marriage is holy. This is why marriage is sacred. This is why we believe marriage should be between a a man and a woman. And when you take it outside of that, it's no longer a marriage. It's an abnormal relationship. And it's disrespectful to that union. So it isn't that we don't want anybody else to partake of marriage or we don't want anybody else to enjoy things or we don't want anybody else to have life or we hate a certain group of people. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with we see marriage as sacred and holy and symbolic of Christ and the church, the groom and the bride. 
Not the groom and the groom or the bride and the bride, but the groom and the bride. And so we can't celebrate. I can't go to a marriage that is not a man and a woman. I can't go and celebrate that. Why? Because it would be disrespectful to what marriage means in the kingdom. So it isn't about being mean to people. It isn't about hating them. I would never go to that wedding. I can't go. Why? Because I can't disrespect this. I know some of you think I'm way off track here now. Just hold on with me. John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is if you are vitally united, my message lives in your heart. Now, I've talked about marriage here, but I could make it about any issue. I could make this about money. I know what the Bible says about money. So if I rob God and I don't pay my tithes, will my prayer life be affected? Probably. I know what God says about adultery and fornication. So if I'm fornicating, if I'm, uh, I'm living in sin, in those, will my prayer life be affected? Probably. The Bible says, be not a drunkard. Don't be a wine bibber. So if we go out to dinner and some, we got to get an Uber home because I probably shouldn't be driving. And I won't get in trouble like Nancy's husband. So I don't want to get pulled over. I'm going to get an Uber. Guess what? Can my prayer life be affected by that behavior? Probably. Why? Because if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is if you are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, you can ask whatever you want. But if I know the word says, be not a drunkard, but I act like a wine bibber and most of my social media is about me acting and looking like everybody else in the world, partying all the time, can my prayer life, can my relationship with God be affected by that? Apparently, according to this verse, yes. Now, not if you interpret your, the Bible your way and you want to live by your concept of that. But, but if my words remain in you, and that is if you're living vitally united to my message and my message lives in your heart, you're living in my word. Oh, Pastor, you mean I never make a mistake? No, 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 I didn't say that. You never make a, a, a wrong choice? Of course, I, of course we do. But, but in areas of my life that I know, I know that's what God's word says. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to listen to that. I know what God's word says. I, I can't, I can't cheat on my wife. I can't be an adulterer. So I'm not going to sit and watch pornography. Why? Because I'm just as much, the Bible says if I commit sin in my heart, it's, it's in my heart. So I'm not going to sit and watch two hours of pornography and think that my prayer life is not going to be affected. That my walk with the king, that the power that I move in, that am I living in the word? Now, don't, don't get all worked up. Don't send me emails. But what about if I just stumble? What if I make a mistake? What if it's one time? God's grace is bigger. I'm, I didn't say you weren't saved. I'm just saying you're not listening. I'm not saying that if you're watching me right now and you say, oh, man, Friday night, I had to get an Uber home. I'm not saved. I got to get saved. I'm not going to heaven. That's not what I said. I'm saying you might need to repent of that. and You might need to ask yourself, am I a Christian really living in the word? Or am I just a Christian? It's, uh, I said it on Sunday morning. It, 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 it takes more than just being able to like Christ. We have to become Christ-like. I'm out of time. And, and I'd love to read some more to you. So will you come back next week? I hope I haven't frightened you off. We're, we're going to look a little bit more next week at living in the word of God. We've only covered two things that we need to do in our lives. And they are what? Number one, increase our knowledge of spiritual principles. And secondly, we need to learn how to live in the word of God so that the word of God is alive in me, changing who I am. This is a huge problem for a lot of Christians. A lot of people where the seed is planted, go read that parable of the sower and the seed. It talks about people who receive the seed, but because the ground is shallow, when the sun comes up, it withers and dies. There are lots of people who want Jesus. They want the word of God, but the soil isn't worthy of it. We need to make sure that our hearts are ready to receive the word of God so that I'm not just a person who heard about Jesus once and I thought, well, I like him. He's cool. No, 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 no. I, I don't just like Jesus. I want to become Christ like. And that's a whole work. That's about sacrifice. That's about obedience. Help me to be a disciple of you, Lord. Father, I, I pray you bless people tonight that have listened to this 
I was going to say simple, but perhaps it is simple in its, in, in its uh, in, as you put it down on paper. But God, it's hard sometimes to make these things happen in our lives. But help us not to make excuses, God. Help us tomorrow to get up, same place, same time, open your word, read a few verses and make it alive in our minds and live with it throughout the day and help us to use it in a sentence. And we ask this in Jesus name. Bless your church, we pray. Join us on Sunday. We're still in uh, profiles and leadership. We're going to be in it for, I think, two more Sundays. So uh, plan to be with us for the last two Sundays in June. Uh, and then, of course, don't forget, uh, in July, we move our study hall from Thursday nights to Wednesday night, an hour early, a half hour earlier at 630 on Wednesday nights. So July 6th. I hope I got that date right. They'll put it down below. We move to on campus live youth worship. We, we got it all going on. It's going to be an awesome, awesome night. Study Hall will be back in the building live and in person. You can still watch us online. You can still watch it whenever you want, but it's going to be live on Wednesday nights at 630 starting July 6th. So we got a couple more weeks yet, but I'm just telling you so you know about it. and You can get ready. July 6th, uh, we start live in person. 630. In fact, at 530, we're giving free hamburgers and hot dogs. So if you live local, come on out, join us. God bless you. I'll see you on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in.